the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Ladies and gentlemen, may I welcome you back and wish you a very happy new year. And I hope that the weather will not be too bad as the months go along so that it will be possible for us to continue the thread of these lectures and discussions uh, with as many of you who can come back as possible. Let me just very briefly indicate where we left off before this long vacation hiatus. It, it hardly seems really that it was only two or I guess it was three weeks ago that we last met. Um, so much seems to happen during the midwinter solstice that it's uh, almost as if another lifetime went by. But you will recall, I think, that after having gone through the general transition from the world of the ghetto to the world of emancipation, we have been trying to outline the major answers which Jews gave uh, to themselves primarily, although in part also to the outside world, to the question of what it meant to be, uh, to live as a Jew in the modern world to live now in a community which was not largely a Jewish community, to live as a citizen of general society, to participate in its education, in its economic opportunity, in its culture, and yet somehow still to be a Jew. The first and most obvious answer was to stop being a Jew. And this was one which, uh, as we saw, many Jews in the beginning of the 19th century uh, took up as a living alternative. The second major answer was the answer of Jewish religion, that since in modern society a man is allowed to have as a private possession a special religion, perhaps being a Jew, therefore, was just being a, having a religion as one is either a Catholic or a Protestant, and just as one can be a, a modern citizen of any contemporary state and still somehow uh, participate in it fully, uh, therefore, to be a Jew uh, meant to be a member of a religious group and therefore to hold on uh, to something private which it was permitted to do. Then we saw that there was another answer, and that was the answer of education, the answer of enlightenment. That perhaps what it meant to be a Jew was to participate in a modern intellectual life and by becoming a full-fledged part of contemporary culture through one's Jewish roots and through one's Jewish backgrounds, yet to be a modern man and somehow to be a Jew. And now finally we have come to the last of the great answers, and that is the answer of Zionism. At our last session, you will recall, we discussed how modern Zionism is born with an unusually prophetic voice, the voice of Moses Hess, who in his classic little book, Roman Jerusalem, outlined many of the basic ideas of Zionism, which we shall yet be following for many months to come. However, as you recall, too, I hope Hess was a voice crying in the wilderness as a man who lived in the middle of the 19th century and as a man of the Western world. For many reasons, the Jewish communities were not ready for him, and not only were the Jewish communities not ready for him, certainly the non-Jewish communities in which they lived were unprepared for him. So today, Hess is remembered mainly as a forerunner and not as one of the active builders of the Zionist movement. And now this evening, we should like to come uh, into the, to the living part of Zionism, to that part of Zionism which is not just a, a foreshadowing, but the actual beginnings of what we know today. Tonight, I should hope that you will begin to see how Zionism began to offer an answer to the problem of what it meant to be a Jew in our time and in our day, and how this answer, even in its beginning forms, has had continuing validity on down through the years ever since. I'd like to start tonight with another precursor, but this time not one who was as little effective as Moses Hess. To the contrary, with a man who not only wrote a book and had an idea, but a man who also became the active head of a Zionist movement. I think, as a matter of fact, the coupling of Leo Pinsker and Theodore Herzl, which I propose to do this evening, is somewhat fortunate. In many ways, they follow the same career. And in many ways, 
the one contrasts brilliantly with the other to make their individual outlines sharper. Now, who was Leo Pinsker? Leo Pinsker was a Russian Jew of a rather well-to-do family, and he had the advantage, being born into a family of some means, of receiving a thorough Russian education. To be sure, he received a good Jewish education as well. Pinsker was steeped in Jewish source materials and had the background of the early Jewish education for which Russia and uh, Central Europe as a whole was famous. One cannot accuse Pinsker of not knowing the Bible in the original or the rabbinic writings or the rest. This would not be extraordinary in a Jew of Pinsker's time. What was extraordinary, however, was that already in the middle of the 19th century, his family was in such a position, living in a large city as they did, that they could see to it that he had the, the best kind of education that modern Russia had to offer. He went to the Russian high school, the gymnasium, and then from there he went to a university where he became a doctor, and he practiced medicine uh, in Russia. Not only did he practice medicine, I believe it was in Odessa that he practiced, uh, a city with considerable consequences in Jewish history. Not only did he practice medicine, but he practiced medicine in such a way as to win the recognition of the governmental authorities. There was a rather severe cholera um, epidemic, the famous cholera, which some of you remember in non-medical contexts, I am sure. Uh, the cholera which broke out and which was a rather ferocious visitation since no one quite knew what to do with it. And Pinsker was among one of the heroes of the a cholera epidemic, the government recognized his merit in this regard. He was an enlightened, a Russian Jewish gentleman, a man who wrote articles in various magazines. He was a, a typical example of the Russian Jewish enlightenment. Not now of the kind of Judah Leib Gordon and others of whom we have mentioned. Uh, he was of that variety who, instead of being concerned with the preservation of Jewish nationality or the, the spirit of the Jewish community was concerned to have other Jews do what he had done. And what was that? To become educated and to become part of modern culture, to suit themselves for the modern world which was dawning upon Europe. And by doing this, therefore, to open the way for the possibility of a new Jewish kind of life in Europe and in Russia in particular. Pinsker said that to be a Jew in modern times meant mostly to be a modern man. And if one wished to hold on to some remnants of the Jewish tradition, this might be helpful. Pinsker was thus, in his own way, a Russian epitome of what Herzl was in his own way. The educated, the cultured, the sophisticated, the man who mixes and mingles on rather decent levels of the intellectual life around him in his society. And like Herzl, he goes through a period of disillusionment. Over the years, the 60s and the 70s in particular, Pinsker became more and more disillusioned with the possibilities of real Jewish emancipation. He began to realize that it wouldn't be enough just to be educated. He began to see that there was something the matter with the status of Jewish existence in such a way that all the education in the world and all the goodwill upon the part of the Jew to change himself would be insufficient to give him a livable and acceptable position in contemporary society. And as a result, in the year 1881, which is the key year this evening, as you shall see shortly, in the year 1881, Pinsker wrote a book and it is a book which I should like to say a word about, leaving out all the other things that happened in the year 1881. Pinsker wrote a book which he called Auto-Emancipation. That's an interesting title to begin with. Auto-Emancipation means you emancipate yourself. It means that emancipation can't be given to you from the outside. Now, to be sure, the members of the Enlightenment, the Haskalah, had always believed that in part you had to take advantage of the opportunities which were given to you and you had to educate yourself and you had to become a modern man. 
But when Pinsker speaks of auto-emancipation, he is speaking now not just of the auto-emancipation which comes after someone has given you rights. What he is saying is, and this is the gist of his Zionist argument, that you have no rights until you can give yourself your rights. This is a theme which Herzl is later to pick up and to amplify in his own way. What is Pinsker's analysis of the situation of the Jew in modern times? Because the entire Zionist position, as the religious position, proceeds from an analysis of the Jew in the emancipated society. Well, he says, look around. What's happening? Are we, are we really free? Are we really equal? Do we really have the opportunity to exercise rights that are ours, that are firm and lasting? <clears throat> no, he says, not true. If you scratch beneath the surface, if you try to look at all deeply into things, and sometimes you don't have to look too deeply. You know, every once in a while there's a swastika painted on a synagogue wall, and you start it in one country, and the next thing you know it's around several other countries. Just take a look at the world around you, he says, without benefit of having read the New York Times in 1959 or 1960. And what do you see? You see that the Jew isn't really accepted. They may talk about accepting us, they may try their best to make us feel uh, as if we are equals, and a few intellectuals may talk beautiful phrases, but what's really going on underneath? What goes on underneath is that, is that the Jew is a hollow man. He's a ghost. He doesn't really exist in the minds of people. Oh, they know individual Jews, to be sure, and they know the Jewish community. But they can't really feel that the Jew is normal, usual, like other people. Because the Jew isn't. Look at them. They look like a nationality. Have their language, even their languages. They have their communities, they have their community way of life, they have their internal forms of government, they have their self-help, they have their history. They look just like a nationality in the sense in which this was word, word was used in the 19th century, and an important word it was. But what don't they have? They don't have a land, have no base, no, no foundation from which they draw their strength or their energy. They wander around living on everybody else's country and no country of their own. Now, how can anybody really believe in a nationality which doesn't have a soil of its own? How can anyone look at you and say, you're a Jew? Oh, yes, you're a member of that nationality, which is based on... He can't. He looks at you and you are a contradiction in terms. You are a member of a nationality that is somehow unfulfilled, that is unbelievable, and this is your problem. You cause images and, and illusions and difficulties to arise deep in the heart of anybody else who sees you. Why don't you have a land? Why don't you live like a normal people on your land, doing the things that a normal people would do? Why do you insist on going around other people's lands? Whenever they have trouble in their lands, obviously you're the one that they're going to pick on. Why not? And then where are you going to go? What are you going to do? On what base do you stand? Therefore, he says, the basic problem with the situation of the Jew in modern times is that it's not normal. It is abnormal. And what we must do is to normalize the Jewish situation. Pinsker is the great father of the notion that it is the abnormality of the Jewish situation which is at the root of the Jewish problem in modern times. That we must somehow become like other peoples. That the definition of what it is to be a Jew must somehow correspond to the definition of what it is to be something else. And since to him the most logical and likely definition of what it is to be a Jew is to be a member of a nationality, therefore the problem is to normalize the Jewish nationality. And that means to give it a land. Now what will happen then? 
if it would be possible for us to take the Jews to their land, Palestine, and settle them on that land and build up a nation, then other Jews in other countries would be normalized. The solution which Pinsker is suggesting is not just a solution for the Jews who go to that land and live. Of course, for them, it is a solution, as we shall see again and again. They have a status. They are Jews living in their country on their own land. But the important part of his argument, and one which has remained a key weapon in the Zionist arsenal ever since, is that if Jews have a land in Palestine, if their Jewish nation is built there, then the situation of Jews all the way around the rest of the world will suddenly become clear and people will understand it and therefore the non-Jew who looks at the Jew will understand who his Jewish neighbor is and accept him for what he is, namely a person whose nationality is connected with the nationality of that land. Now this argument has been repeated down to the present day, namely that it is the establishment of the state of Israel which has normalized the position of Jews throughout the rest of the world. And that by virtue of the establishment of the state of Israel, the dignity and the inner worth and the position of Jews around the world has been changed. Even though it's quite clear that they don't owe any political allegiance to that state, the existence of that state has an effect upon their status. Now we shall have to come back to this argument again. It's a very interesting one, and it's a double question. It is first the question of psychology, which is to say, so you are proud of what the Jews have done in the state of Israel, and you are proud that they have built a democracy, and you are personally enthusiastic about the way in which they have managed to defend themselves and to show that uh, Jews under these circumstances can build a rather uh, enviable communal way of life. But does that really affect your status except in terms of your enthusiasm or the enthusiasm of your neighbor? Your neighbor may be filled with admiration for the state of Israel. But is it the fact that you now have a land which is somehow connected to you that has changed your status in his eye? Would your status, for example, still be positive in his eyes if he happened to think that the state of Israel was too socialistic and that the state of Israel was disturbing American foreign policy in the Middle East and we really need the Arabs and he disliked the state of Israel but the fact that you had a land would nonetheless give you status in his eyes I am therefore trying to separate in your minds because I think it's important to do so the psychological from the political argument Pinsker's argument was not psychological he was not arguing that when the Jews of the state of Israel do things that will make everyone feel good, then it will be good for you. No. What he was arguing was, regardless of what the Jews of the state of Israel do, the very fact that there is a state will take the situation of Jews in the rest of the world and give it some basis. And the Jew then, wherever he goes throughout the world, could be a Jew in modern times by virtue of a fact that he is a member of that nationality which has come down through history and which has based itself almost always in the land of Israel but is now based in the land of Israel once again and he is a member of that group which is related to that soil. We are obviously dealing here with a modern Zionist argument. And this argument was not like Hess's argument, an argument which somehow trailed off into the air and had to be recovered later. Because Pinsker's little pamphlet, in a day when people did not have radio and television, Pinsker's little pamphlet caused a powerful stir. And as a result, a conference was called, the famous Katowitz Conference. And out of this conference, there came the first modern Zionist movement of any size uh, called the Chobavei Tzion, the Lovers of Zion. And this conference proceeded then to start to do uh, Zionist work. Tried to buy a little land, tried to send a few pioneers, tried to support the people who were there, began uh, training clubs to teach Jewish children how to 
be physically alert and alive so that they would be prepared to go to the land. It began preparations for those people who wanted to go, but mostly it was self-preparation. It's interesting that here, once again, the career of Pinsker parallels that of Theodor Herzl. A book and the meeting, a pamphlet and a congress. This is what happened in the affairs of Pinsker. But it's interesting to compare this Chovavetsia meeting with what was later to come, because this was an illegal organization. The police watched it. It was a seditious, treasonable organization from the Russian point of view. Doesn't sound as if times have changed very much in Russia, does it? Zionism is still treasonable and heretical. It's the kind of movement which is not allowed. Why not? Because the, these are the days in Russia of strong Russian nationalism. And an analysis which says Jews aren't really at home here, <coughs> until Jews pick up and go to the land of Palestine and settle there, is an argument which is an argument against Mother Russia and which, inten which tends to encourage another kind of nationalism. This is, in slightly different language, the same argument which is used against Zionism in Russia today. The Jews, on the one hand, are accused of being cosmopolitans and on the other hand are, are accused of being too nationalistic. So that the members of Chovah Zion were members of an illegal group. They had to meet secretly and uh, had to carry on their activities uh, as a kind of a conspiracy. And as a result, a large part of the organization's work was handled through students. The university students, who are, of course, far more active in European universities and political activity than they are in the United States, particularly in our own day and age when students aren't active in anything which requires a signature. The students then, in the first place, had rather more freedom of movement. They had contact with all kinds of people, and they were unusually good couriers of information and activity, and on their occasional visits back home, they could carry the word and pass along the information, and being the young intellectuals, they were reading the pamphlets and writing the books and the like. But therefore, it's the kind of an organization which, instead of being led by grown, established individuals, although that was true too, was very largely in the hands of young students. And, of course, it was a small organization, never grew very widely. How could it under these circumstances? Mostly what it was interested was in certain kinds of small, little practical details. Yet, we must give Pinsker the credit for what he did. He was the first president of Kobevetsio. He was not just a pamphlet writer, as Moses Hess was, but he was the head of a movement, small, tiny, illegal, scattered, and therefore in many ways the forerunner of Theodore Herzl. Now because my interest in this series of lectures is largely ideological and intellectual, I've left out the whole historical background of the period. If one goes into the history of Russia in the middle of the 19th century, there is so much of fascination to help you understand how men like Pinsker could feel at one stage of his life that there was a future in modern enlightened Russia for any Jew who was willing to take the time and trouble to seize it. It's quite clear to see, too, how he could become disillusioned. Russia of the middle of the 19th century, every once in a while, seemed to be pursuing double policies. Alexander II, who was the czar of much of the period before the writing of auto-emancipation, seemed like he was a liberal czar. Now, compared to the Russian czars, being a liberal czar was probably not a very difficult thing to do. Most of them had been unusually reactionary and had followed policies which made the rest of Europe really seem like enlightened, modern, developed, and cultured community. But when Alexander II came along, he seemed to have new ideas and new interests. Every once in a while, uh, he would extend certain freedoms, open certain privileges, even to the Jews. And every little scrap of freedom, propelled as it was by the ideas of what was going on in Western Europe, with the gradual emancipation of Jews and their emergence into full equality into society, 
seemed as if it was opening up a similar future in Russia. It looked as if Alexander II, from time to time, might really bring the same kind of world to be in Russia as was coming to be in France, Germany, England, Holland, and some of the other countries of Western Europe. Of course, every once in a while he did the opposite. Every once in a while, led on by some fanatically conservative and reactionary leaders, men whose whole motto was Russian nationalism, and whose Russian nationalism proceeded on the basis of uniting all the Slav communities of Europe under the heading of Mother Russia. These men fought in the other direction, because what made Ru Mother Russia strong was her allegiance to the Russian Orthodox Church. And therefore, what strengthened the Russian Orthodox Church was good. The Jew was not only an alien on a nationality basis, he was an alien religiously. And these men every once in a while saw to it that he was reminded of it. But as long as Alexander II was there, and particularly in the early years of his reign, there was enough basis to encourage the men of the Haskalah to think that the future was going to open for them. Any year now, another few years, a little more education, a little more opportunity, and the Russian Jew would have a place for himself. There were, however, always people among the Russian masses who not only thought that progress was slow, but that it would never come. Revolution seems to have been a, a continual alternative in Russia. And one day, Tsar Alexander II had a bomb thrown under his carriage, and he was killed by it. He was assassinated by a bomb the old image of the Russian revolutionary getting ready to throw his bomb is, you see, not entirely without foundation. There is some basis for it. They got Alexander II, and he was a liberal. The revolutionaries considered Alexander II, in his small liberalism, such a reaction that he was better off dead. I just want you to get it in perspective. Then came Alexander III, and if Tsar Alexander II might have been considered a liberal, Tsar Alexander III, who had carefully been nurtured by the men around his father to grow up to be a different kind of man, he was a thoroughgoing, complete reactionary. Thoroughgoing and complete in a Russian sense. And as a result, the year 1881 marks a critical turning point in the history of the Jews of Central and Eastern Europe. Until the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, it might have been possible to have hope. After the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, a series of events took place which made it almost impossible for anyone to believe anymore that the Haskalah program of enlightenment and intelligence and if we Jews educate ourselves, we'll be accepted in the Russian world. What happened? Two things. After the assassination of the Tsar, perhaps without any plan, in one city after another city in Russia, there were pogroms against the Jews. Nothing terribly serious by modern standards. You know, the figures don't run into the thousands. In many cases, they're under a dozen casualties. You know, just looting and burning and destruction of property, a little rapine. Nothing terribly serious by modern standards. But it's interesting what happened. Not only did the mobs loot and pillage, but there were no police around. The police always didn't come until a day or two days later. It was therefore quite clear to any observer, even the foreign attachés who wrote cables back to their government, some of which have, were later published, it was quite clear that this was a matter with government connivance. The government condoned, possibly even encouraged, this kind of thing. And the liberal Russians, the great newspapers, not all of them, but a good number of them were among the journals which were inciting to riot against the Jews. 
Were the Jews the revolutionaries who killed Tsar Alexander II? Not particularly. There was one young Jewish woman who was implicated in the assassination. But the Tsarist police used this as a means of concentrating attention upon the Jews. This was the first crushing blow. If you are looking for an opportunity given to you by the government of imperial Russia to become citizens, stop looking. You're not going to get it. What the government is interested in you is seeing to it that you are used for their purposes. Secondly, in May of 1882, based upon some ordinances which were issued earlier, the government finalized a set of temporary decrees concerning Jewish life, and these became known as the infamous May Laws. And these May Laws mark the imposition of a whole series of restrictions upon Jews which were not lifted really until the Russian Revolution of 1917. What were these resolutions? I almost said revolutions. There were a revolution in Jewish life. Jewish life had been getting better somewhat. There were laws regarding where a Jew might live, what kind of occupations he might engage in, and the like. And not only did they deal with what a Jew might do in the future, but where he currently was. For example, it was ruled that no new Jewish settlement might take place outside of the large cities. Now, what does that mean? No new Jewish settlement may take place. Well, it means no Jews may go out of the cities into the rural areas. When the cities get overcrowded and difficult to find jobs, you go out and you establish yourself. You can't do that. But not only may no new Jews go out and settle in the rural areas, the right to decide whether or not Jews were new settlers or not new settlers were vested in the local non-Jewish authorities. Therefore, if you left town for a few days and came back, you might be classified a new settler. If a member of your family was sick in another town and tried to come to live with you, you might be classified as a new settler. If economic hardship deprived you of a living in a given village, you might have to pick yourself up and move to another village which couldn't settle there because you were a new settler. Or to make it even worse, the local authorities were given the right to decide which Jews were vicious and undesirable, and they could be forced off the land whether they were new settlers or not. And thus the laws were put into effect and Jewish expulsions began to take place. Now it is estimated that about 40% of the tremendous Jewish population of Central Europe was living on Russian soil in rural areas at this time, and these people were continually forced off. Or take the opposite point of view about the way a Jew could make his living. Well, it was obvious that Jews would no longer be able to uh, engage in farming or any of the uh, petty activities that they had engaged in with regard to the rural areas. With regard to the professions, the number of Jews in the professions was cut down, I think, from something like 22% or 19% of Jewish lawyers that were allowed. The number in the bar was cut down to 9%. Just like that, and the rest were expelled. A numerous clauses of a very strict variety was now imposed upon the universities to prevent Jews from going into the professions. And if it's bad enough with the professions, you can imagine what it was like with the crafts, where the rule was imposed that ex except by certain special circumstances, Jews could not engage in arts and crafts in which they were required to use machines. So that, for example, if you're a watchmaker and you had to use a small lathe in your activities, a Jew could no longer be engaged as a watchmaker because Jews were no lo longer allowed to use small machines. Now, this is a sample of the May Law legislation. It's quite clear what it is and what its purpose is. Its purpose is to drive Jews out of the country or to drive them to starvation or death or drive them to conversion. As a matter of fact, the famous Russian minister of the interior, whose name I can never pronounce, some of you who are more Russian than I may pronounce, what is it, Podobonestov? Something like that. That's what it is. You, you, know, you can find it. I, I used to be able to say it just as a party joke to make other people pronounce it, but I, uh, I unfortunately don't have it this evening. 
He announced quite openly that his policy was one-third of the Jews to die, one-third to immigrate, and one-third convert to uh, Russian Orthodoxy. Now, can you imagine the effect of that upon the Haskala people? who had been building up a whole movement to educate and will be citizens of modern Russia, get away from the parochialism of your background, go into the new and modern way of life, learn algebra, learn chemistry, learn geography, learn world history. These people who are writing belles lettres in, in Hebrew so the Jews could now have an, an aesthetic understanding of the universe, could appreciate nature for the first time. Why? So that they could be citizens of modern culture, so they could participate and partake in everything that a modern man with the full range of his senses would be involved in. Now, what was the result? The result was that they were told, we don't want you. We don't want you. You have really no place in our government, in our state, in our country. What was their alternative? The alternative, and I think it's an important one to understand, particularly for us, the alternatives, it seems to me, were quite clear. The obvious one was to get out. And that's why the great Central and Eastern European immigration to the United States, although it begins in the 70s, becomes an absolute flood in the 80s. Over 100,000 Jews a year arrived in this country beginning in the middle 1880s and kept up until right before World War I. That's where the Jewish immigration to the United States came from. And the whole American Jewish community is still founded upon that immigration, mostly. So that was one possibility. Suppose you didn't want to go to the United States for one reason or another. Suppose you couldn't. Or supposing intellectually or emotionally you just couldn't bring yourself to it. Then what? Well, supposing you wanted to stay and change things. There was only one way to do it, and that was revolution. Revolution was a real, a significant, and a valuable option under those circumstances. A man would have to be untrue to the history of the United States of America to deny the value of revolution under those circumstances. I honestly don't see how you can say that the Americans were justified in rebelling against the British and not say that it was worthwhile to have a revolutionary movement in Russia in the late 19th century. That Jews went into the revolutionary movements in great and considerable numbers is due not only to the fact that they suffered special disabilities and not only to the fact that they have a tradition of freedom. It is due to the fact that there was no other living possibility Revolution was one of the few ways of settling the problem. And I don't think we should deny its value in reality. There was another way. And that other way was Zionism. If we cannot find our place in a state which will not give us rights, then let us establish our own state and give ourselves rights, auto-emancipation. As long as rights have to be given to us by others, they'll always be in danger of being taken away. As long as we live in somebody else's state, there's always a possibility that they may turn against us. Therefore, let us make our own. And now, you see, to this whole mass, this reservoir of the Jewish population in Central and Eastern Europe, the Zionist analysis of the situation of the Jew in modern times becomes a key to understanding their own position. For these Jews, who were the majority of Jews living in the world at that time, the emancipation is a fraud and a delusion. And the only real hope of living as a Jew in modern times is again to get out. It's either revolution or get out, only this time to get out through the Jewish people. Not to go to America, and there too to have to live under somebody else's tutelage and suzerainty, but to live in our land, with our people, in our government, under our rights, and to establish it ourselves. Thus, Pinsker comes along 
with an argument which, when added to what happened in 1881, forms the background <coughs> of the development, forms the background of the development of a modern Zionist movement. Are we being attacked by humans from the outside? There is a tree. Burning. There is a tree burning. Burning. Yeah. Someone is burning Christmas trees. No, no, it just caught fire. You just caught fire? Yeah. Spontaneous combustion. <laughs> Dear friends, the 92nd Street Y is temporarily safe from attack. Interesting, isn't it, how safe we all feel in the United States um, <laughs> that a few swastikas painted on a few synagogues around, and uh, I found Jewish groups very jumpy the last few days, and Jewish individuals quite jumpy too. Um, would you mind adding that, please, as a postscript to the Zionist analysis of the situation of Jews not in Central and Eastern Europe under the Tsarist regime, but in the United States of America, and your own analysis of this situation and acceptance of it, I think should be in part considered by the emotional undertones uh, which are to be found among Jews in the last few days. i just leave it uh, at that. Now to poor Herzl, whom I have delayed all evening long, apparently. Now when we pick up with Theodore Herzl, we pick up in another world. Theodore Herzl is not an Eastern European Jew. He can only be called a Central European Jew if you want to make Vienna part of Central Europe. Maybe Vienna is geographically related to Central Europe, but intellectually and culturally, it was Western Europe. As one of the truly great cultural capitals of the world, <coughs> Vienna was the home of that kind of culture which we associate with the great capitals of Europe, Berlin, uh, Paris, and London. It is not to be connected largely with Moscow or Sofia uh, or any of the towns of Bulgaria and Romania. When Theodore Herzl, who was brought up and lived his formative years uh, in the town of Vienna, therefore grew up as a westernized Jew. He did not grow up, therefore, with the kind of Jewish background that young Jewish boys in Russia and Poland were still getting. He grew up more or less as a young American Jew might grow up today. That is, if I may be permitted the remark, largely ignorant of Judaism. I doubt that he got even the kind of Jewish education that a child would get in one of our fairly decent religious schools today, because he, the family wasn't even religious. I mean, they were kind of Jewish by name. And the young Theodore Herzl grew up to be a, a citizen of his community, went to the schools and went to the university and became a doctor of jurisprudence because he was obviously going to make a fine career for himself being a modern Jew of, uh, of Austria, and what was Jewish about him wasn't quite clear, except the fact that the other students at school uh, didn't quite like him. It was quite clear that there was a certain formality and coldness in relationship uh, to him. By this time, anti-Semitism had become a, a political movement, a tool of certain of the reactionary groups in the politics of the time, and he felt it. Apparently, he was quite sensitive to it, but there's no outward expression in his work. He left the field of law rather early and uh, decided to be a writer instead. Wrote a number of plays which were moderately successful, one of them with a, a rather conventional, liberal uh, attitude towards Jews, but nothing terribly special. There's no reason to think that he was concerned with the problem. Uh, and then he began to write uh, a kind of literary form which is no longer popular, called the Phaeton. The Phaeton was a, a clever essay, sophisticated, bright, alert. Take a topic and you write off about it. 750, 1,250 words, something like you take your theme. The hats in Paris uh, and their relationship to the political climate. It doesn't have to be quite that frivolous, but it's something which is not only both serious and profound and yet very alive and very gay and uh, very witty. Wit and the Phaeton go hand in hand. Uh, and Herzl began to write these, and it turned out that he was a rather good hand at it. He was such a good hand at it that uh, the, uh, the great uh, 
Viennese newspaper, the Neue Freie Presse of Vienna, invited Herzl not only to write Phaetons for them, but to become their Paris correspondent. Well, now, what could be better than to be a correspondent of the New York Times of Europe, practically, and to be their correspondent in Paris, of all places? Couldn't do much better than that. So he went to Paris. Now, he got to Paris, and he served as correspondent there. And there he ran into the Dreyfus Affair. It's true, one could spend a lot of time discussing the Dreyfus Affair and its background. I am interested in it this evening only in relationship to the problem of Zionist ideology. If you haven't read about the Dreyfus Affair, we had a couple of good books on the subject uh, uh, last year, I believe it was, and they're very readily available now. In brief, there was Herzl sitting in Paris, writing back dispatches to his newspapers, and the thing that was agitating the government, there had been some financial collapses, the, the, the democracy was in danger of going down, uh, there were all sorts of, of charges and countercharges, uh, anti-Semitism had become a political weapon in the uh, modern France of that day, but uh, this was all going along when poor Captain Dreyfus was accused of having sold uh, uh, secrets of the French army to a... Uh, a foreign power, obviously believed to be Germany. Well, well, who was poor Captain Dreyfus? A Jew. The kind of Jew who never was inside a synagogue, had no Jewish education, didn't care about Jewish education, didn't want to educate his children to be Jews. The most unlikely Jew to be picked to be the victim of a plot. A man whose whole life was to be devoted to do one thing only, to be the very best kind of soldier that France could want. A man who has to go about this with the kind of passion that only a Jew can have, who has to prove that he's really as good as everybody else. They couldn't have picked a better object lesson of what happens to Jews who are trying to prove something to somebody else. So here was poor Dreyfus, and as you know, there was a tremendous frame-up, and sooner or later the church was involved in it, and the army was involved in it, and all the reactionary forces were involved in it. All of this is unimportant. What was important was the focus which this affair brought to whatever previous feelings about the Jewish situation Herzl had. Why? Because Dreyfus was a Jew. No matter what he said, no matter what he did, no matter what, he was a Jew. And at the famous scene, so stirringly depicted in Hollywood, in which in the courtyard of the Ecole Militaire, as I recall it, Dreyfus was drummed out of the French army with the epaulets loosened and the drums drumming, the braid is torn from his uniform so that he is now standing there only in a dark blue suit and then is taken out in a way to prison. And of course there's one of the correspondents, there's Theodore Herzl standing there. But none of that makes any difference. What's interesting is what the crowd is yelling outside these iron gates. What the crowd is yelling is down with the Jews. Down with the Jews. Not down with Dreyfus! Not death to the traitor, but down with the Jews, all of them indiscriminately. And where is this? This is not Mandarin China. This is not feudal Tibet. This is the home of liberty, equality, fraternity. This is the European cradle of democracy. This is the home of the rights of man, of modern European freedom. And the people who have been born and bred on the ideals of freedom for over a hundred years now, just about a hundred years, these people are the ones who are saying, down with the Jews. And there's Herzl. He's heard anti-Semitic agitation before. He's, he's covered all kinds of political rallies for the paper in Vienna. He's covered all kinds of agitation in Paris. Now, according to some theories, it was this specific incident, although that makes it a little bit too clear, 
which moved him. Maybe it was an accumulation, Lord knows what. He was never the same. He was never the same. Something had changed. Notice how the Pinsker story is repeated. Even in a way that Moses Hess story, the cultured, enlightened man who tries to make his way in the Enlightenment, who succeeds more or less, who even gains the approbation of those around him, over a period of time becomes disillusioned, and perhaps a single event comes along and says, can't go that way, I've got to go the other way. It's the same story repeated. The Jew comes out of the ghetto, emerges into modern society, and finds the way is barred. And now he's got to find a, another solution. And what is the solution? The solution is Zionism. Trying to put it very simply, Herzl did four things. Each of them, in their own way, contributed to the future of Zionism. In the first place, there is the book. Have to write a book. Have to have an idea. Have to talk to people. Herzl wrote the book, he said, with the wings of eagles beating over his head, as if he had a great vision. Now, what was his idea? His idea was the establishment of a Jewish state. That there should be a Jewish state established, and that it should be legally recognized, and that Jews from all over should go there. And he organized the whole thing, a Jewish company and how they would gather the people together, how they would settle them on the land, how they would build it up. Nothing about the history of uh, the Jewish people and its nationhood. Nothing about the Jewish dream of returning to the land. Nothing even about Palestine, except for perhaps one vague hint. There's a little thrust at Argentina. The idea of a state to solve the problem. Jews to have their rights because those rights are given them by Jews and not as a gift from the outside. Jews to have their own country and their own land so that they are finally secure. If you're not secure in France, where are you secure? Let's go to our own place, have our own country and our own idea. And he has one new contribution that no one had ever thought of before. And that is the idea of the charter. The gigantic Jewish corporation which is going to set this needs a legalized charter. It's not to be clandestine. It's not to be undercover. It's not to be secret or treasonable. It is to be a legally given right for these Jews to go settle in that land. His scheme is that Turkey, as one of his schemes later turned out to be, that Turkey, which was in need of money should get its national debt refunded by Jewish bankers in return for allowing the Jews to go into Palestine to settle there. Not such an impossible scheme in logic, but in politics it turned out to be a little more difficult. A very clever scheme, but notice it's legal, internationally recognized, not hidden at all. Now the pamphlet created quite a stir not so much by what it said, because none of it was really terribly new, and as a matter of fact, a lot of it had been left out, but because of what it led to. And it led to a meeting, a Congress, a Jewish Congress, a convocation of Jews from all over the world. The idea was such a dangerous idea that when they tried to have it in a German city, the Germans refused to allow it. The German Jews said, oh, no. Don't you associate us with that. We are Germans by our nationality, and this is our country, and we have no interest whatsoever in these Jews who are trying to have a meeting. So as a result, it had to be held in Basel. It was held in Basel in Switzerland, where the Swiss, being very tolerant, almost anybody could do anything. And the meeting was actually held. Jews came from England, Jews came from France, Jews came from almost all over the world. Jews came there. And no one was more surprised than the Jews themselves. Why? Because it was an open meeting. And the Jewish people was there. All of it represented, alive, determined, united by an idea that Jews ought to act on their own. Now this was the important thing about the Congress. Not just that it was an instrumentality through which this was going to be carried out, but that the Jewish people united behind an idea. 
It was the first real effort to organize all the Jews, not in a conspiracy to overthrow anything or in anybody, but to build a land to decide upon establishing a home for the Jewish people. Now, if you will compare this to the French Sanhedrin of some few weeks back, you will see the difference. The French Sanhedrin met because Napoleon called them together. They met to answer questions that Napoleon gave them. They were terribly eager to let Napoleon see that they really could be modern. What better difference between the attitude of Jews in a hundred years than the contrast between these two meetings? These Jews meet because they want to, under Jewish auspices, for Jewish purposes, for Jewish will, to try to find a Jewish destiny which they were going to determine. And then they did it. I mean, it's remarkable how they had a Congress, and then they started to work. There was Herzl chasing all around Europe. Saw the Kaiser, he finally got a chance to see the Sultan and some of his flunkies. He visited uh, high officials in the Russian government. He, he met with the, the English and the French. He met with everybody. Six years, he traveled around like a crazy man talking to everybody. And they saw him. They saw him, the idea that this thing was really going to work was taken up as part of European politics. This was not an illegal clandestine organization. It was internationally accepted, not quite on the level of national law, not quite on the level of countries opening up formal relationships where there wasn't a government in exile by any means. But compared to anything the Jews had done before, this was the first time that the Jewish situation in modern world had been placed on a really international level, and it began to become part and parcel of the problem of contemporary international politics. But if Herzl wrote a pamphlet, started a congress, and began to carry out political activities, none of this is as important as perhaps the most important thing which he did, namely, that he took into himself the symbolism of what it meant to create the kind of Jew we need in our day. The modern, enlightened, Western, intellectual Jew who said we need a Jewish state. Herzl was Zionist. Zionism in all its ramifications, Eastern, Western, traditional, modern socialist, all of it, could find itself in Herzl. He must have been an extraordinary figure, even to look at photographs of him today. He is described to us as something looking like something in the Syrian prince, black curly beard, black curly beard, piercing eyes. You sometimes get a photograph in which the eyes seem to literally burn on the page. Just looking at him, you become hypnotized. And he is described at the various Congress as magnetizing the delegates, even when he didn't do anything. And when he finally made a trip through Eastern Europe, the people would pour out of the ghettos in droves and yell, Hamelech Herzl, the King Herzl. Herzl the King. Extraordinary man. Some men are given the power to summarize in themselves and their personalities and their lives the aspirations of a whole people. That was Herzl. You may have hated him, you may have disagreed with him, you may have disliked him. But Herzl took this thing, this Zionism, which was small, almost meaningless, and had no future, and brought it to life. Couldn't have done it without the Pinskers and others like him. Probably couldn't have done it without the pogroms in the background of Eastern European history couldn't have done it without what happened in Western Europe. He couldn't have done it without the truth involved in the Zionist analysis of the situation of the Jew in modern society that maybe the emancipation is a fraud. But there was something specially Herzl about it. He had what we call in modern times the charisma the power, that special gift which makes an unusual man. And so he was able to write in his diary 
that famous paragraph, in Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I said it out loud, people would laugh at me. And maybe they are right. But 50 years from today, they will not laugh. Now that's a boast, isn't it? That's the kind of thing we all like to say. You'll see 10 years from now, 25 years from now, 50 years from now. But what are you going to do with a comment like that in a diary? So it wasn't 50 years, 51 or 52, I've lost the exact count. It's incredible, simply incredible that he should say it. And it should happen. It should happen despite all the, the nations and the powers and the politics and the like. This is one of the great Jews of modern times, even though he didn't know anything about Judaism. Didn't understand very much about the attachment of Jews either to their religion or their tradition or their culture. It just wasn't his way. Even though he spent six years chasing the dream of a charter all over Europe. But out of this emerges the Zionist movement as reality. And out of it emerges the Zionist answer to what it means to be a Jew in modern times. And the Zionist answer is in part, in essential part, at least two things. One, to be a Jew in modern times means to live in a Jewish state. You want to really have rights? You want to really be a modern man? You really want to be free and emancipated? There's only one way to do it. Get your rights in your own state. That's what Pinsker said, and that's what Herzl said. And while Herzl is not quite so clear on what happens to Jews outside the state, it would seem logical enough here to connect him too with Pinsker, namely, by establishing that state, the condition of Jews around the world will be normalized won't be for them in the future what it has been in our day. The basic Zionist analysis, at least as far as we have taken it, is an analysis which negates the emancipation, which says you cannot rely upon the rights which have been given. It is only part of the Zionist argument, and next week we shall have to take up the more positive part of the Zionist argument as we move forward to one of the other thinkers who filled out Herzl in precisely the area where he needed the filling out. But at least this far we have come to understand a significant part of modern Zionist ideology. You want rights? Live as a citizen on your own soil. It's the only way you really get them. So long as you live as a citizen on other soils, at least have that state. And then, as we shall see, others come along who say, to live outside that state, you can never really live as a Jew. But this is another parting way in Zionist ideology, which we shall take up later. Well, I talked a little longer this evening than I anticipated. Now we will only have about uh, eight or ten minutes for questions. So if you should like to ask, I should be happy to answer. Yes? Oh, I figured we might as well start out the new year in a challenging fashion. And I have only my own reaction to reading the newspaper. Please. Well, I am one part horrified, and the other part but let me see, there are parts of the United States. This may be just an absolute rule. The problem of whether the United States is different is one of the key problems in understanding the situation of Zionism in our own time. And I must ask you to continue coming through March and April until we get to the point where we can discuss this question. But I think you need to see it in its background. Notice, every Israeli who has been nurtured on the major section of traditional Zionist ideology who reads of what's going on in the paper says, so what are you surprised about? Of course it happened. It's going to happen. It'll happen again and get worse yet before it gets better. You want to be safe? Come to Israel. And not just safe. I mean, how can you really be at home in a country where any minute people may start painting swastikas on uh, synagogues? Or may even do worse than that. You have no real Jewish security wherever you are. 
The only place that a Jew can be a Jew and live as a, as a decent human being, you know, without fear, is in the state of Israel. I won't go into that argument, but I, I think this is a logical reaction, and uh, this negation of the possibility of living a viable Jewish life outside the state of Israel has been one of the, it's not the entirety, but one of the main stems of Zionist ideology. And it causes one of the major difficulties today between the overwhelming majority of Zionists in the United States and the considerable, though not the entire, part of Zionist ideology, insofar as one can speak of such a thing, in the state of Israel. Uh, you, when you're speaking of Pinsk and uh, Herzl, and you, you emphasize the political aspects of the movement, but their followers, Without the followers, there could be no movement. There wasn't the political yearning, but actually more a religious yearning. I'm afraid you're wrong. Will you forgive me? Sure. <laughs> Fed by religious ties, in the same way that the modern young Jews' notions of marriage are still fed by religious roots. Oh, overcast and covered over. God forbid he should identify himself as a religious man, you know, nobody's allowed to be religious really today. Um, those religious roots will affect the way he conducts his marriage. Still. But he doesn't consider himself religious and he isn't overtly religious. And the same thing is largely, though not entirely true, of the early sources of the Zionist movement, um, particularly in central and Eastern Europe. You must remember that in the early days the overwhelming majority of the traditional rabbinate were opposed to the Zionist movement. The Zionist movement was a modernist movement and it shortly became an anti-religious movement as we will see. So I'm afraid I agree with you that the roots stemmed out of the Jewish religion but they were in no way overtly connected. And Pinsker and Herzl were talking not entirely the language of their followers, but largely the language of their followers. Now, when we discuss Ahad Ha'am, you will see how Ahad Ha'am takes up the other side, but on a cultural nationalistic basis. Uh, Hertzberg, in his nice book, The Zionist Idea, calls him very beautifully Ahad Ha'am, the agnostic rabbi. Very nice. I think handles the situation quite nicely. How can you be related to the tradition, Jewishly authentic, and yet not be religious? Achar Ha'am tried to find a way out and supplies that, sp that part of the Zionist movement. And we shall go into that. Yes? Oh dear, you, you really mustn't ask me such questions. Uh, I'm terrible when it comes to dates. The Basel Conference was 1896. The Napoleonic Sanhedrin had to be sometime after 1789 and before 1812. Okay? I would guess that it was sometime, now let's see, we might as well work it down progressively. Napoleon didn't uh, get in charge until somewhere around 1805. So if I had to guess and have to surrender my you know, rights to act as expert, I would guess sometime around 1805 and the other 1896. And at any time that you wish to probe the limits of my... Did you find the date? 1806. 1806! Ha ha! Give that man 64,000 kosher dollars. I mean, look. Yeah, I just prefer to get to my dates that way. Yeah, so you see that in a period of 90 years, not quite a century, the entire complex of the Jewish reaction to the emancipation has largely changed. One more question? Yeah, yes. Uh, you probably read recently about this Jewish uh, Hasidic rabbi who has, is settling now. Yeah, with the Klausenberger Rav. Yes, <laughs> with his uh, followers. Yeah. Now, these are religious groups. And yeah. against Zionism, and yeah. they too feel that uh, Israel uh, is not the, the, the country that the Messiah has uh, chosen. Yes, that's right. Or, 
But you know, if you need a ghetto to live in, you might as well live in a ghetto surrounded by Jews, non-observant Jews. Because uh, you know, if you have a ghetto here in Brooklyn, then the people that you are mixing and mingling with are not Jews by and large. Yes, they, they have ghettos here. And what about our friend the Satma Rebbe is getting ready to buy 500 acres out in New Jersey somewhere and build a small uh, community village of his own. Um, I'm, I, this, I'm not quite sure about the Spring Valley settlement. This is to be a whole village with its own factories and stores and the like. You see the alternatives. Do you go back to the ghetto? Or do you come into the modern world? If you come into the modern world, how? Now, the fact that every once in a while you have a, a reversion to the ghetto indicates that the problem has not been solved to everyone's satisfaction. And thus, if we have to, we can continue next year. May I, before I close, point out to you that this great institution and over 116 others in the city of New York are maintained through the Federation of Jewish Philanthropies of New York, to which it is my privilege to give each year. If you have not yet made your donation to the Federation, the usher at the door has blanks for you. If you have already made your donation, may I thank you for helping to support a worthwhile Jewish activity and one of the oldest Jewish religious acts. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.